Can we push this further? We probably can. This expand went down to 0.01%. Um, if, if you have a decent working asset, you can probably spike in more background, concentrate it more. I was running 40 copies per reaction mixture. You can probably push it up to 100, 200. You can also, uh, alternatively, just run more droplets and uh, push this fraction, this, uh, the, the fraction that you can detect even further. So this is something that, again, is, is as far as I know, is not really possible with, um, with such ease with any other technology. So pretty amazing to see this kind of data. The next application I'd like to talk about is copy number. And this is very exciting, especially at this meeting. You know, copy, CNVs have been a top, hot, very hot topic here for the last five years. And, uh, but the whole field has been somewhat hobbled by the fact that so far we've only had arrays and real-time PCR to try to measure them, right? But now it looks like things are changing. We have these huge sequencing projects that are make, mapping out individual genomes in, at a huge depth. So you're actually starting to pick up um, digital signals for copy number estimation. And uh, digital PCR presents a really nice complement to the deep sequencing studies that are happening because once you find those CNVs, this, is, this represents a really good way of validating um, the copy number estimates on a large number of samples. And also if you then follow, want to follow on it into diagnostic and, uh, and related applications, you probably don't want to be doing spending $30,000 or $20,000, so I don't know what, it, what the current price is per genome uh, to be doing this in the clinic. So um, how do we do copy number estimation? Very simply. And the goal is to estimate the number of copies of target gene per genome in a genome. The first step we need to do is actually separate out the copies in the genome. We do this using restriction digest. So the idea is if you have four copies of a particular gene uh, on, a, on a single chromosome, if we simply try to count those copies, because they're linked to the same chromosome, the chances are they'll end up in the same droplet. So we first break it up so that they're floating up separately and they'll end up in separate droplets and then we can count them. Now, once you've separated out the copies, you can measure the concentration of your target. Then you measure the concentration of your of a reference housekeeping gene that you know is present at uh, two copies per genome. This way, you get an accurate estimate of the number of genome copies you have in your sample. And then you simply take the ratio of your target to the reference and multiply it by two because you know there are two copies of your reference present in your sample. Does this work? So here's um, a particular gene. MRGPRX1 that is known to be present in four copies in, um, um, uh, in a particular Coriolis sample and five copies in another Coriolis sample. We ran, it, uh, we ran it in five replicates. And uh, I don't know if how many people here have uh, seen data like this from real time or any other technology. I would bet that I personally have not seen data like this ever, pretty much. But Notice a couple of things. First of all, how tightly the numbers are correlated from run to run, from well to well. Notice also how tightly they cluster around integer values. Um, this is exactly four. There's pretty much no doubt whether this is four or three or five. It's four. This one is five. Very little, again, doubt about it. If you try to run something like this in real-time PCR, you might get an answer like 3.5, 2.3, 5.6. You may be able to average it. You may be able to run enough of replicas that eventually you'll get something close to four or five. But uh, Now, this, this was a relatively simple experiment. Two, um, two samples, well-described uh, copy number estimates. So then we um, became curious in this gene, CCL3L1. Some of you know this, was, this became famous um, about five years ago. There was a big paper in Science where they found um, the number of copies of CCL3L1 to be associated with HIV susceptibility. However, there was, there was a, quite a bit of controversy since then when people have tried and failed to replicate some of those results. And in the end, the consensus seems that it's just really hard to do copy number measurements, at least for this gene, using real time. And it's not really that surprising um, this is, uh, for example, this is a plot from that science paper. And I'm sure the, you know, those people in particular know, knew what they're doing, and they, they got as you know, good data using real-time PCR, or as good as data as one could get. And this is a distribution of copy number estimates on the x-axis and the frequency across a lot of people on the y-axis. So you see you have some peaks around one, some peak, uh, two copies, one copy, 
um, two copies. Is it, no, I think it's zero, one, two, I guess. And, uh, but you also have a, a whole bunch of estimates that are 1.5, which, you know, again, you don't know what that means. Um, and then there's, like, there's a big uh, kind of wide uh, model after the two copies where you can't really tell three from four or three from two, really, or any of this. So given that it's so imprecise, and also given um, how difficult it is to do real-time measurements, um, you, can, you can also expect that copy, no, copy number estimates, if you're not very careful in terms of how you um, collect your cases and your controls, there could potentially be a drift. And it doesn't take that much drift, that much difference between cases and controls for you to get a spurious association signal. A lot of people know this from all the GWAS studies that have been done initially. And um, this, I could see being a, a special problem for CNVs where you really don't have ground truth um, with, these, uh, with these measurements to compare to. So, I mean, it seemed like a decent challenge for us to, uh, to try right off the bat with our instruments. So, so we tried three different assays from three different papers um, in CCL31 and to see how well we can perform. And this is how well they perform. So this is interesting. We, we picked specifically two samples, um, two Corel samples, NA18916 and NA18507. And 507, uh, we specifically picked because it's been quite well studied. Some of, my, some of you might recognize it because it's been sequenced fairly extensively. So, and, and in the paper, I think this was a paper from Evan Eichler, they actually specified that CCL3L1 is present at uh, seven copies in the genome. So we have this reference, so we, we ran it. Um, actually, one of the scientists is in the audience who ran it. And he came back to me and said, no, nah, it looks like it's six. I'm like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure it's seven. Uh, he went back, ran the second essay, no, nah, it's six. Uh, went back, ran the third one, all right. Uh, so then I went back and looked in the supplementary materials of the paper, and uh, uh, as it turned out, they, they had 5.7 as their estimate in the actual table when you look deep down in the table. So maybe 5.7 ended up getting transcribed into seven, the five and the dot got dropped, but it was kind of an interesting validation to our, <laughs> uh, to our approach. And uh, we then expanded this experiment to run this on 13 Coriol samples. And again, so you can kind of work through them and uh, see how well it's doing. Four copies, two copies, six copies, five, and so on. So it starts getting, as you can see, the confidence intervals, which we're estimating using the Poisson distribution, get, uh, get a bit wider as you're going up in, uh, in copy number. Um, but they're still quite tight and uh, they clearly cluster very near integer values. And uh, one thing, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you want to get more precision, you simply run more wells, you run more droplets. Um, each one of these is 20,000 measurements. You run, each, each triplet is 60,000. And if you combine those measurements, you get really tight estimates. And this in itself is self-validating because we know that copy number estimates should be clustered around integer values, and they are here. And I have not seen other technologies besides deep sequencing that give you that kind of data, that kind of clustering. So I hope you're convinced that there are some really amazing advantages to the system, to this droplet digital PCR technology. It gives you really high precision. You saw those confidence control. You saw the variation from point to point and how closely they cluster to each other. It also gives you really good accuracy. The, the fact that the copy number estimates cluster right around integer values is, uh, is a measure of the accuracy in itself. It gives you absolute quantification. You're getting, for example, with EGFR data, you're getting actual numbers of molecules in your system. You don't need to run a standard curve. You don't need to compare whatever CT value you're getting against some other CT values you have generated in the past and trying to uh, figure out exactly where it maps. And you can detect rare targets in complex background. Again, going back to the EGFR, story where you have tons and tons of similar, very similar sequence, sequence that's different only by one base, and you're able to detect six molecules in that background. So again, we can imagine many, many applications to the system. I hope I gave you some glimpse of what it can do. Jerome, we'd love to hear from you 